What's up, bangers? Welcome back to the Banger Hanger for the brand new version of your favorite show from Banger TV. This is Lock Horns Redux. Not live, but in some comfy chairs, sitting down and discussing, debating, and locking horns around all things metal. Yeah! This week, we're digging into the subject of the decade in review. That's right, 2010 to 2019 has come to a close, and it's time to take stock. And to help me with that is Bradley Z, Hello. or Zed, as we say, yeah. in Canada. Good to see That's you. That's right. And Joe Smith Englehart, welcome to the studio, Joe. Nice, nice to, meet, to you. meet you. Bradley, what's going on? What have you been up to? Uh, just freelance writing a lot, bar backing at a local venue working on developing a video series on hip-hop. And spending hip -hop. a lot of time at the Banger Hanger. We're, we're spending a lot of time at the Banger Hanger. We I, like that. I, I do a lot of stuff. I, I, I don't ever get bored, which is nice. Nice. Joe, tell me about what you've been doing. What, what's, what's going on in your, your metal world or music world right now? Uh, so as of Riesland, I've been doing a lot of news and features with Alternative Press and uh, did an interview with the band Higher Power. They're a hardcore band from the UK, and they kind of mix a bunch of different genres together. So that was a really fun one to do. Cool, exciting. Um, so let's get right into this. I mean, I think, you know, obviously at Lockhorns and Banger TV, we spend a lot of time looking back at the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and, and the 2000s. But here we are looking back at the 2010s. Uh, Bradley, I mean, just to get this going, what, what, what was unique about this decade that we just went through? Uh, Joe and I actually met earlier and we were talking about this and I'm going to leave, leave, leave the D word for him, I'll give him that one, but uh, one thing that I think defined the decade and neither of these things that we're about to say are things that are going to please the audience at large, but I do think that they're definitive of the decade. Uh, you know, the black gaze sound of okay. Death Heaven, you know, I think it's undeniable. It's gotten a lot of people into metal or like tangentially metal stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, you can argue how metal or aren't metal they aren't, but they're close enough that they've gotten people into it. And they're kind of like always like the default metal band on festivals now. And I also think that, you know, something that I never thought would ever happen is new metal has kind of come back uh, as an influence and, and even mm. more overtly. Um, mm. A few years ago, I wrote a feature for Exclaim, and one of my proudest moments is getting in print, new metal jumps the fuck up again. And uh, I think that that's only being embellished on over time. And I just like, that was such a hated subgenre. I yeah. never thought Interesting. it came back. Well, yeah, I guess we're into some, I mean, everyone has a different argument for how long the music generational cycle is, but arguably it could be about 15 years and here we are, new metal is back. Uh, Joe, for you, what, what signifies this decade we've just lived through? I think the big thing that I noticed with this decade is kind of a digitization of sounds. And the big thing that came out of that was Gen, which, you know, Periphery, Veil vale Maya, bands like that mm -hmm. started popping off and getting a lot bigger. And they kind of defined a whole movement that carried over into everything from metalcore, deathcore, mathcore, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And you kind of see that digitization sound like a really compressed, tight-knit tone in everything from prog metal and so on and so forth. And, you know, adding in seven, eight, and nine string guitars seemed to be a thing that really, you know, came up this decade as well. Yeah. And it was present a lot more in the 90s than I'd say the 2000s, but this decade alone, it was really, really present. That's a really good point because I think the, the a hallmark of the previous decade, 2000 to 2009, was the emergence of the digital revolution. You know, the internet, social media, starting to define the way people listen to music and consume popular culture. Uh, and now in this, just this previous decade, what I would layer on top of that then, in response to this sort of digitization of sound is you've got the reaction to it, right? You've got a lot of older, but actually a lot of younger bands sort of consciously making a more retrospective kind of sound. Would, yeah. would you agree? Yeah, 100%. Yes, okay, so we're just uh, touching the tip of the iceberg here. Uh, let's go to the comments and see what people have to say about the biggest moments in metal in the last decade. First up is Mystic Mind, uh, Patreon contributor, thank you. The biggest metal news of the decade for me was the death of Ronnie James Dio. His loss is still felt to this day as he was an icon like no other. Um, Christopher Beams uh, says Tools album, perhaps. Certainly the most hyped over the course of the decade culminating this year 
uh, in 13 years of waiting uh, over and a victory for the over the insipid pop music in the album charts. Bold words. Derek Jarman, also a Patreon contributor, said, I thought Phil Anselmo's outing uh, for white supremacist uh, slash racist behaviors by Rob Flynn was pretty significant. Here we have one of the biggest names in metal in the last 20 years being forced to go dark for a little while because of the le level of uh, opprobrium, rightly so. I feel like it changed the conversation and made uh, that neo-Nazi shit less acceptable. Brian Goldstein from Patreon um, comments, the best story is also my best album of the decade. Uh, Behemoth Nurgle got leukemia and came back triumphantly with The Satanist. The production sound is the band's best production and they've evolved their sound to make something that uh, more true fans uh, love. Alex uh, Posilkin, I was thinking more of metal cultural changes during the decade than events, but one event stuck out to me and that's Trent Reznor earning an Oscar for his score of The Social Network in 2011. I know the score is not metal, but I feel his win earned some kind of a, re a recognition not only among composer peers, but that heavy musicians are incredibly creative and can certainly contribute to areas of mainstream artistic culture that are not used uh, to metal musician input. That's uh, that's an interesting point. It, uh, it is amazing score. I have the soundtrack. Matthew uh, Mock, uh, I know some people have mentioned the deaths of Dio and Lemmy, but I haven't seen anyone mention the death of Jeff Hanneman. Kevin Daly uh, says Axl Rose and Slash burying the hatchet. Uh, Milos Kochi or Kotsi says, for me personally, it was Lockhorn series. I think that probably came from our producer, Brian P. Oh, he just changed his name. Uh, that started a new wave of my interest in metal and opened for me the door to more extreme subgenres. Thank you guys. Okay, lots there. Brad, any, any, any comments there Com for you? I mean, what do you want? You want comments or do you want a couple events that I think were like significant that we that were not included there. Add to the list. Add to the list. I mean, yeah. I think a huge thing is uh, Randy Bly's uh, trial mm -hmm. and yeah. how we dealt with it incredibly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maturely, sure. you know, he, yep. he dealt like he dealt with it like well, and I really respect him mm -hmm. even more. Mm -hmm. You know, he just, just seems like he just seems like a cool guy, yep. and it's very cool that they're one of like the largest metal bands, like one of our spokespeople, and they carried that event with like such grace. Yeah. Uh, that. The, and a, l a little bit of a less uh, positive note is the whole as it lay dying thing. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, I do think since they've come back, they have handled it quite well. But the fact that that was even a thing was just, you know, not, it's not a, it's not a, that's not a the good kind of thing you want. On a more lighthearted note, I'm a huge fan of the grindcore goat. There was a goat uh, in, I think, I don't even know, Indonesia. Or, it was Indonesia, in, Indonesia yeah. who watched grind, who watched grindcore bands like uh, famously Warm Rot. He would just stand in a barn where there were shows and watch them perform. And he's a little bit of a legend for that. He's he's passed. His name is Biquette, which I think translates to goat. So his name is Goat the Goat. And I am definitely going to get a tattoo of the grindcore goat. It has also, of course, become the decade of like really young people and old people playing metal, which has just this become this crazy online sock phenomenon. web. Uh, yeah, for you, Joe, uh, any other events of note that you would want to add or comment on what the viewers have been saying? Uh, one of the big stories that I'm thinking about, uh, just because I always like seeing whenever metal makes its way into the mainstream, but when Metallica and Lady Gaga ended up performing together at the Grammys, despite all the issues with not giving James Hetfield proper mics, uh, I think that was a really big moment to kind of just push Metallica and metal as a whole into the mainstream again, which mm -hmm. I really enjoy seeing that because I think that the more people who listen to the metal, the better. Yeah, it's an interesting thing because of the internet, like it almost feels like metal is inevitably more part of the mainstream because you're just always here. Like Randy's thing, it's sort of like that story kind of traveled through you know, mainstream music media it was in Rolling Stone and other publications. So it seems to me, I mean, you guys both work in media, and so do we in a different sense, but it's sort of like there's this blurring now where you don't have this clear, hard distinction between like the underground metal media and the mainstream media. I mean, if you want to like talk about something like that recently, uh, some of the members in Archspire were in a show with Jason Momoa because he loves right. their band. Right. And then Ollie taught him how to do vocals. And then that was getting picked up by CBC and all these other things where it's just like, there's like almost like an acceptance, like what they do is not what I like to listen to, but what they do has value. What they do has value in teaching Jason how to do that vocal, which added to his performance, which added to the show. Like I think there's yep. almost like a, an acceptance as metal is not necessarily art you like, but an art that is accepted. And yep. I think another th another huge 
thing is rap is inarguably the biggest music in the world right yeah. now with the SoundCloud rappers and so many of them liking metal and stuff. Right. I think in the next couple of years there's going to be like a trickle down effect. I right. think that well we I, live in what 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 theorists call, you know, the age of the music omnivore, right? Like yeah. I have an 8-year-old son and beside Drake is Slayer, right? And you ne you know, this is the way people listen to music now and so inevitably you're going to get these crossovers. I mean, yeah, Brent Hines from Mastodon was in Game of Thrones and you know, you've got this kind of like it's all just becoming one giant mashup. W what are your thoughts on that, Joe? Uh, one thing that I really thought about with that, just going into the fashion world a little bit, was the big story between you know the Kardashian family, Kanye West, and everybody kind of co-opting metal bands that they very likely don't listen to, but putting that into you know big magazines like GQ or Vogue, yeah. and you know that's kind of crossed over into a bunch of different things. You know, Billie Eilish is somebody who ended up putting out mm -hmm. a couple of different merch items that were designed around death metal logos. And even thinking about Justin Bieber and Rihanna, yep. they had a couple of tours where most of their merch looked just like metal merch. Yep. And most of the fans of those people probably don't know anything about it. Right. But maybe there will be a few who go and check out something after right. they and kind of discover the, that. The best part of all of that, of course, is we have Gary Holt from Slayer and Exodus basically saying, fuck all of you Yeah, I uh, mean, in classic Holt fashion. I think it's interesting that now it's kind of swinging back the other way and that some of the some like some metal artists like their merch is starting to look like SoundCloud rapper merch with like all these like small like 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 it's almost like a tattoo flash thing it's like little things all over it and like mm -hmm. text everywhere mm -hmm. and then they have like small text down like lyrics down here mm -hmm. anyway um actually Joe do you think it's relevant you know you wrote that uh that article for exclaim like the year end piece and I think that's kind of relevant to this with all like the crossovers yeah so that was something that you know it, it was something that I noticed a lot in 2019 is that uh, metal bands didn't so much collaborate with artists outside of metal too too often before but then you know this year you know we ended up having Post Malone do a song with Ozzy Osbourne right. and Travis Scott yeah. there was a uh, feature uh, from Slipknot's Corey Taylor on uh, Kid Bookie this UK rapper right. and that kind of happened with a bunch of different rappers and pop artists Bring Me The Horizon was a really big example that came up with a lot of people in the metalcore world because they brought in a beatboxer on their album. They had Grimes on the album. But then they also had Danny Filth from Cradle of Filth feature on it. So it was still somewhat rooted in the metal world, but yeah. completely breaking out of the metal world. That's right. World. We just have this sort of ongoing kind of collapse and dismantling of the hard lines between between genres, between subgenres, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of good stuff there, but lots more to talk about. We're going to pivot now to talking about the most important tours. Uh, in metal over the past uh, decade. We'll go to the viewers. First up is Christopher Mark Edward Matthew Vitor. It's a lot of names. Uh, <laughs> Even by Joe's standards. <laughs> pick one? Uh, anyway, I think the big four of Thrash Show should get a mention. It was a great, it was great to see them all to come together. Andrew Luopicus, best overall concert experience was the last Soundwave Festival in 2015. Slipknot, Judas Priest, Lamb of God, Ministry, Soundgarden, Faith No More, and Steel Panther all on one bill, doesn't get any better. Not really a tour, but anyway. Uh, Jan or Jan Burf, one of the best concert experiences for me was seeing Sabbath for the first and last time in Essen, Germany in 2014. It was open air and there was a huge thunderstorm. Everyone was soaking wet. After a couple of songs, Ozzy brings a big bucket on stage saying, well, that's some fucking rain out there. You know what, I'll join you. And then he empties a full bucket over his head screaming, now let's fucking party. Uh, also hearing the song Black Sabbath with Real Thunder in the intro riff is probably the most metal thing uh, ever. There's lots more though. Speed round. Well, I mean, for me, probably seeing Slayer for the last time in 2018 uh, was probably the biggest metal live moment. Uh, how about you, Brad? You want tours in general or specifically for me? I want whatever you want to give right, me, bro. Right. I'm just here to open the floor. I think uh, the launching of the Decibel Tour in 2012 has been huge. You know, a, a yeah. magazine exclusively about like the underground and extreme mm -hmm. always produces a tour that's like at the top tier of that. I think specifically, uh, there's the one year where it was Carcass, Black Dahlia, Murder, Gore Guts, and Noisem, and mm -hmm. then the following year was At the Gates Converge. Valen Fire and Paul Bear and like yep. those two tours alone were like when I saw like Converge was touring at that with at the gates like phew, yep. you know like 
So those th that was huge. I think another huge tour I mentioned earlier, not even as a prog metal fan, but there was a Between the Barry to Me, Cynic, Scale the Summit, Devin Townsend project tour, and mm -hmm. that's like, that might be the best prog metal tour ever. For me personally, my one of my favorite shows that I have ever seen uh, was the Decibel 100th issue celebration. Yep. Converge played, which also marked the return of John Baisley from Baroness on stage. After the bus crash, he performed yep. uh, uh, Coral Blue with them. It was incredibly emotional. And then also performing were Pig Destroyer, Repulsion, Municipal Waste, Tombs, and Evoken. And that was huge. And then I saw, I saw Suicidal Tendencies in LA. And it was the unveiling of the Mike Muir mural. And then, uh, you know, it was in, it was like outside, but there was a fence area and people like rocked the fence and broke the fence down and police came in helicopters and shut it down. And like, to me, that's like the perfect suicidal experience. Like it doesn't get any more suicidal in LA than that. So. Just living vicariously, because what happened to me this decade is I became a dad twice over, which means I don't go to nearly as many metal shows as Brad Zed for you, Joe. What were some of the big live moments for you this past decade? Uh, I'm definitely going to be showing my age a bit here in my comments, but uh, two tours that I thought were really good that I actually didn't get to go to were the Death to All tours mm -hmm. and NASM doing the reunion tour. Yeah. So I was underage and the shows in Toronto were 19 plus. This guy, eh? I missed out very sadly, but I think that those two tours were really, really cool because so many fans weren't able to see death before Chuck Schuldner ended up dying, right. but then they were at least able to experience some of that live. Yeah. And same thing with NASM, you know, a lot of people didn't end up getting to see that band. And I think they're such an integral part of Grindcore that you really want every age of person to be able to capture that, but some people didn't and they gave enough people a chance to come back and actually see that again. Might be just me. I mean, I struggle these days to fight. It's very rare where you actually get a touring package where there's three or more bands, say, on the bill, and they're all, it's like the right moment for all of them to be on the bill together. I think it seems very rare to me these days. Like, it's usually about the headliner, or maybe there's a there's an opening band that there's a lot of buzz about, and that's why you go see them. I mean, it's fresh for me because it was 2019, but obviously Amon Amarth, the AAA Swedish show that just that just ran through Toronto, Amon Amarth, Arch Enemy, and At the Gates, I thought was actually that's four A's. A good four A's, good uh, a good bill because it makes sense, and all those bands kind of belong together in a way. And that was like, wow, this is. Like, these are all older bands, yes, but it was a great package. Thinking, you know, based on that, again, these are, first of all, I'd like to say, obviously, being that we're in Canada, uh, close to America, these are these tend to be North American tours that we bring of up course. here. I'm sure there are plenty yep. of other tours in yep. the rest of the world. But and we're pretty spoiled because we're Toronto-based, so yeah. we get all the big big tours that roll through, right? But uh, speaking of, like, something that you, like, like, that you just said, like, the... Uh, the return of the relapse contamination tour. I think that lineup was essentially perfect. You know, you had right. Dying Fetus, Incantation, Gate Creeper, Genocide Pact. It was just right. death metal perfection. They, yep. they, the fact that they were able to brand it as the contamination tour, like which they used to do and stuff, was just it was nice. It was yep. uh, that was a good moment. I think. Cool. I think touring touring's changed a lot, right? Uh, in the sense that a lot of these tours, they're obviously packaged with a particular sponsor or it's a label. And if you if you take one. You, you dig one layer deeper, you realize that all the bands on the bill are on the same management company, which I don't think, you know, the average metal fan doesn't know that, but you begin to, once you get into the industry, you begin to realize why these bills are put together, and it's because of money. That's why we're here. I mean, it's strictly to make money. We, you know, uh, metal is secondary. Anyway, let's move on uh, to, I think uh, this is the one I'm looking forward to the most because it's a way to look into the future of metal and what's coming down the pipe. The best um, debut metal albums of the past decade. Uh, Mystic Mind uh, believes that the best debut album of the decade for me has to be Alien we Weaponry. Uh, it's rare to see indigenous folks join the metal scene to bring their issues to the table, but these three teens from New Zealand did just that and in doing so are keeping the Maori language alive when it's in danger of extinction. Maxime Roland, one of the best debut albums of this decade must be The Aura from Beyond Creation. This album changed the game and the sound of the already well-established tech death scene. They managed to get popular all around the world with one record and are still on top of the list. And Ushban says, for me personally, Ghost, Opus, Eponymous, uh, really unique and different uh, metal band, especially when it first came out, was refreshing to hear metal without double bass drums and with actual singing. I like double bass and screaming style metal too, 
but the 2000s to 2010s was saturated with such bands. All right, Steve Brown, debut albums. What's missing there, Brad? <sighs> debut albums. Um, Cult Leader, Lightless Walk, they came back. Uh, the majority of the members used to be another band that came back, and I think that the album is just an absolute masterpiece of metallic hardcore with, you know, extreme metal influences all over the place yeah. and some morose singing. I think Counterpart's album, Profits, is, is phenomenal. They don't like it. Fuck you, Brennan. But um, it's wonderful, you know, uh, Misery Signals kind of worship, yeah. um, metalcore stuff. And Frontier put out Orange Mathematics. I was fortunate enough to tour Europe with them. And I think that album was incredibly forward thinking in part or largely due to the fact that the guitarist wrote everything and programmed the drums. So it was programmed in a very rhythmically strange way. Uh, yeah. I think the Boof Mad album that came out, it just like it just checks all, all Brad, Brad's boxes. Remember you and Blaine were talking about how like, of course, Brad would talk about the weird Russian band with the name nobody can pronounce. But Don't put that on me. That's all Blaine, man. Death, grind, and like some metallic hardcore all in one. Like, are you kidding me? The Brand of Sacrifice. He just knows you. He just loves yeah. you. Yeah, the Brand of Sacrifice album again. You. Same thing. Blaine yeah. was kind of ripping on me for it, but I think that that was an awesome, uh, an awesome debut album as awesome. well. Awesome. What about you, Joe? Uh, I, I know Bradley mentioned Frontier. That was a really big one for me because uh, I was super into this band, the Tony Danza Tap Dance Extravaganza. Awful name, great band, but... I think it's a great name, but um, anyway. When they broke up, they broke up in 2012 and didn't do any shows to kind of send off that last album, which I think was their best album. And when I found Frontier just a few later, or a few years later, sorry, uh, I thought it would capture just about everything I wanted from that band and more. So that was a really good one for me. Mm -hmm. um, the other one that I really think was a great debut album was Code Orange Kids' first album before they changed their name to Code Orange. Right. I felt like that captured a lot more of what I wanted out of that band with a lot more speedy parts, kind of more power violence than just straightforward, down-tuned hardcore. Yep. Uh, so those two albums were really, really big for me. And the other band that I think maybe not so much their debut album, but kind of transitioning into their second album uh, was Godmother because with Dillinger's Escape Plan breaking up, right. there was kind of a hole missing for those insane live shows and Godmother kind of checked off everything I wanted as far as a really high energy live show. Their albums have everything you could want out of kind of hardcore leaning math core band. So yeah. those three albums especially. I think probably the two debut albums that made the most noise, at least at Banger TV, were Power Trip and Gate Creeper. I mean, those two bands, you know, got a lot of attention really fast with their debut albums. I think for me, two standouts kind of at opposite ends of the metal spectrum. One, I'm a big fan of Ancients, their debut album, Heart of Oak, uh, West Coast Boys. I really like their kind of mastodon -y kind of style uh, that they're creating. I think their, their, their sophomore album was even stronger than the first, but the first one was super strong. And I don't know if it counts because it's a bit of a super group of, of established musicians, but I love the Ultimus record that came out last year. It was my favorite album of the year, uh, Something Wicked Marches In, of course, with David Vincent and Runa from Mayhem and Flo Mornier, which I thought was a really potent effort uh, and it's hard when these super groups to come together and actually create a distinct sound that sounds like a band and not just a bunch of guys trying to show off their uh, their chops but kind of connected to this Brad is you know maybe you know what were the best new bands uh, of the decade you know not necessarily bands that uh, may have put out their debut albums but bands that came that are, that arrived uh, in the past decade yeah I mean full of hell formed um towards the beginning of the decade. Yep. Um, actually, they might have formed at the end of the last decade. Either way, oh, we'll make they, it they, count. They, really, they really came into their own. They put out so many albums this decade that it's just like insane. Yeah. Their, debut was, their debut was definitely good, yep. you know, their debut full-length album, but it, it, it was kind of a hint of things to come with like the, how insane that they would take it in like more metallic direction, um, you know, elements of noise. They were more hardcore back then. Yep. Um, that that band is is, is huge in, in that in regards to that. I think Horrendous is a band we have to mention again. The the debut album was good, but I don't think anybody could have really predicted where they'd be going, especially right. now in the more progressive genre or way that they're going. Blood Incantation as well. Even yeah. before Star Spawn, they had like a bunch of releases, to, almost to the point where it didn't feel like that was their debut. It felt like they had like a catalog of work before Star Spawn. But I think as a whole, like they've really been a huge um, band this decade. T same with Tumult. Yep. You know, and then. Uh, 
Sanguisugabog only have a demo out. They only have four songs out, but mark my words, that band's going to take over yeah. this fucking decade. Yeah, okay, so in the spirit of Breaking Rules, they did form in 2009, but I want to talk about them anyway because I think they made a big mark Just like with their most recent album that, of course, is Rivers of Nile, uh, uh, where the Owls Have No Name, I think, is one of the, the most uh, exceptional metal albums uh, in, in a while. And the other band I think deserves mention is, of course, this odd duo from the north of England called Sludge or Sluggage. I call it Sluggage. You, you, you kind of got to, you like, have to say it because otherwise it doesn't work the theme. Yeah, I call it Sluggage. I sluggage. got beat up for calling it Sludge. It's like, well, why spell it that? Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, Esoteric Malacology. I was kind of blown away by that record. I think it's uh, I think it's really strong, but I think that, that Sludge has an even better record coming than that, but you can definitely hear, hear it on the horizon. Joe? Uh, I kind of want to touch on Ghost a bit more just because I do feel like that band is really, really important to metal at this moment because I really enjoyed their first record. After that, I didn't enjoy their music quite as much, but you know, seeing where they've been able to get as far as going from playing club tours to headlining arenas and playing as headliners for festivals, that's a really big notable thing, and I don't think that there's yeah. a ton of bands out there who are new that are able to no. do that at this point. There's no question that Ghost is th probably the biggest story from a singular band perspective Easily. of this past yeah. decade. I mean, there's no other band that even comes close to going from not existing to playing massive shows. You're absolutely, absolutely right. Any other new bands you wanna, uh, you wanna get in? The other new band that I've really enjoyed is Venom Prison. I feel like that band checks off everything that you would want out of death metal and they're easily my favorite death metal band that's come out in the last couple of years. Uh, their new album is absolutely fantastic. And just seeing that you know their vocalist is able to tackle issues within misogyny and sexism and stuff, in death metal is a really good shift and kind of shows where the genre is headed in the next few years. Amazing. Yeah, it's exciting. I think there's a lot of good metal to come in the next decade. But um, let's move on to uh, reunion or comeback albums. Uh, I think there were a lot of really important ones over the last decade. We've got Nathan Howell. Best album uh, slash comeback of the decade was Carcass, Surgical Steel, um, Chris Ty. Uh, who's also on Patreon, says best reunion album, Possessed, Revelations of Oblivion. The originators of death metal returned some 33 years after their last full length with a consistently furious platter that nails the willing to the wall. Anyway, Cameron Shepard, best comeback album for me is a tie between Slipknot, not sure if that qualifies, uh, and Tool definitely qualifies, although both bands didn't break up. Their albums hit home so hard after five and 13 years away, respectively, uh, upon release, and have been real standouts for the year and the decade overall. Uh, Maxime Roland is back. The comeback of At The Gates and their, their return album at War With Reality is one of the nicest, the nicest things to happen. That's so nice. I got so excited when I saw like that news pop up. I remember I was at University. Yeah, but did you go? That's really nice. No, I will. No. I, prob <laughs> I think I probably started yelling at anybody who was in my oh, way. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I danced a jig for sure. This album is an amazing comeback record and did not disappoint. It still captured their own sound and bringing something new to the table. It must have been hard to pull uh, that off with so much expectation. John Boyle also on Patreon. I don't think I noticed at the time, but this decade, this decade, excuse me, was all about comebacks. I remember when Surgical Steel came out, which was important. Uh, I Hate God, At the Gates, and Exhumes Second Act are examples of this. I think Joey Belladonna rejoining Anthrax was huge, and all of the big four having solid releases within a few years was important to young people becoming metal. It's, yeah, it's interesting. Metallica's not here. That doesn't qualify, right? Anyway, Angular, Aguilar Will, comeback album Mayhem, Daemon. I'm thankful, thankful for the clean production of this black metal album. I personally think it emphasizes the beauty of the band and how credible they, they can sound whenever they expand their horizons. Lo-Fi got played out for me and I can finally enjoy my favorite black metal band uh, again. Um, Derek Jarman, also on Patreon, says, when Pepper Keenan returned to COC and they put out No Cross, No Crown was huge for me. Also, Jesse Leach back in Killswitch finally seems to have hit it uh, with, with uh, Atonement. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. We've got other albums, Black Sabbath, 13, Tool has been mentioned, Anthrax, Faith No More, uh, more Killswitch. It's a lot. 
A lot of comeback, a lot of reunion. What do you think? Well, first of all, I want to say Slipknot doesn't count. A five-year five year wait for an album is really not that. How long was Metallica? Does that count from Death Magnetic to Hardwired? Does anyone have that? Seven, eight? Seven, eight years. So, oh my yeah, God. I don't know. Anyway. That, fuck it, who cares? Uh, I think that they stayed active. <laughs> but somehow Tool qualifies. I don't get it. Tool qualifies. Let's not, let's Tool not, qualifies. I don't want to get it. into the math. Um, yeah, and Mayhem doesn't count either. But either way. Uh, I also think it was weird that that comment said Kill Switch on Atonement. I think Kill Switch on Disarm the Descent, which was the actual reunion of Jesse right. with the band, was great, uh, especially after this self-titled number two, which is definitely their worst release. Number two? You they, just gave it one of those? Yeah, but they, they don't even play songs off that. They know that that album. And then Disarm was great. I mean, I think another band that we need to mention is Gorguts, Return of Gorguts yeah. with Colored Sands. Yeah. Huge. Uh, and 18 Visions, yeah. uh, a metalcore band. They actually, you know, unlike so many bands that broke up this decade and then reformed like two, three years later, which is like this really weird, annoying trend where it's like a business move to break up, get people at your fucking final tour and final shows, and then get people when you come back excited. It's weird. There have been bands who broke up and came back, like Lionheart, and I didn't even know that they did. Anyway, 18 Visions waited a decade. They came back. They played a show. I was there in LA. That's when I saw that suicidal show. And the album is, is awesome. It's everything that I could have wanted in an 18 Visions reunion album. It's metalcore again. Their last song was on the rock side, and it, it's just great. Hard to get a word in with this guy, right? You guys he speaks a very fast. Yeah, he, we he, hang he, out he a lot. He it in there. I got to learn. I speak too slowly. Joe. You think? Uh, any, I don't. any faves in there or any to add? Uh, one of my favorites that got mentioned a ton in there is easily Carcass because not only do I think that Carcass coming back was super important, I think Surgical Also because you weren't alive the last time they put out a record. I was not even alive when Carcass was around before. So being able to see Carcass and have them also put out an album that good felt very awesome yeah. as a young metal and band. And it also means he likes Swan Song. So. Yeah. I do like Swan Song. That also means that. I will go toe-to-toe -to -toe with anyone saying, I, I think two of the best albums of the decade, Comeback, Reunion, whatever, doesn't matter, of all albums, At the Gates at War with Reality, I risk it getting jumped in the metal streets because I've gone on record saying, in many ways, it's a better record than Slaughter of the Soul, which of course record. is great. practically heretical. I think that this record is better than it would have been if they had rushed it, if they had made it in 98 or 2010. Because now they had time to reunite, they had time to feel how they work together and to sort of tone out all the outside expectations and do what they yeah. wanted to do. Because yeah. it, feels, it feels like they've done the album they want to. I mean, one of the biggest driving forces is that it's still fun. It's still fun to create and yeah. write music. Of course, that's the initial driving force when we started out in our teens. Of course, we were very aware of, of the legacy. And of course, that's a huge bonus, you know, uh, because starting out today fresh as a new band, it's really, really hard. It's, it's almost like a digital ocean with a million of bands. You have to be seen, you know, and get your music across. It, it's hard, you know. So of course, we are very humble to the fact that I mean, we have a classic record. And the same applies to Surgical Steel. I think actually think Surgical Steel is a better record than Heartwork. Easy. Again, Easy. not making any friends, but those are two phenomenal metal records. I, I think I could go on. My At The Gates review, I think I, I said something to the effect of like, you know, there, there's like a lot of weeping melodies and stuff throughout it. And I think I've ended it with essentially saying, and the only reason I remember this is because one of my writers at Exclaim messaged me and was like, this is like top tier journalism. So I was like, shout out to him for stroking my ego, which cemented in my head and allowed me to say it here. But I, I basically said, instead of, you know, writer, writing slaughter, still slaughtering the soul, they wrote something else and built on their legacy. You know, Amazing I think the record. easiest thing that they could have done is done a rehash, yeah. uh, made it a little bit more thrashy, a little bit less emotional, which they didn't. And I think same with Carcass, they yeah. kind of found a way to somehow make it feel like all of their albums exactly. at the same time. Yeah. They both found a way to make it sound exactly like the band that they are, and yet nothing about it felt redundant like, or like dated retro. or re retreaded. Uh, we'll stop there because we could waste an hour. Dude, I could do an on those two albums, at least I will. Uh, so just quickly, also, the, what were the biggest bands that broke up? Oh. Called it a day. Here's a list just to get uh, going. Rush, Black Sabbath, Slayer, Motorhead, Typo Negative, Soundgarden. Kind of a somber decade in a way. Yeah. So I mean, a dude, lot I, of bands I, wrapping it up. I also, uh, speaking of somber, I have a list of the people who died this decade. You know, we started out with, with Ronnie James Dio in the same year we had Peter Steele and Paul Gray from Slipknot. But then it, like the year 2018 is just like the most depressing year in terms of deaths. I'm not even gonna try to list the people off because it's like a massive list, but just go look it up and you'll be like crushed yeah. at how many huge, 
uh, important figures died that yep. year. But uh, in terms of bands breaking up, uh, this one is, it's funny, Joe and I were talking about this before. Uh, we could have answered this for basically every question is the Dill Dillinger Escape Plan. Okay. We, we, we went to their final shows together. Okay. Um, that band breaking up was huge for us. Seeing those final shows was huge for us. And you know, basically outside of new bands and you know, uh, debut albums, I'm pretty sure Dillinger could have applied for best shows, best everything for, for us. For me, and I've said before, we've talked about it, the one that hit me the hardest was Slayer. <clears throat> I think with Rush and Sabbath, <clears throat> I mean, we're talking about bands that, you know, formed in the 60s and 70s. I mean, they've both had their run and they've had their time. I think for Slayer, had their run, had their time too, but there was something just, I don't know, just kind of different about that. Wasn't ready to say goodbye. I didn't think it was going to be that impactful for me that Slayer was calling it quits, but it kind of felt like the first band of that next generation that was calling it quits, not from that sort of the first generation of metal and hard rock bands like 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 Sabbath. It was like a, a definitive 80s metal band was 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 calling it uh, quits. So was it all Dillinger for you too, Joe? Uh, for me, Dillinger and Slayer both yeah. really hit home. Slayer especially, I was yeah. lucky enough to see them with Jeff Hanneman once. Um, yeah. And that was easily one of the best shows I've ever seen. Um, Dillinger Escape Plan, I think I saw that band 15 or so times across about a decade. Wow. That, that band really, really sucked to see go. Uh, mm. On the same note of bands that have really hectic live shows, I felt really bad about seeing the Chariot break up. Mm. Uh, they were a band who, you know, they lit their drum kits on fire at the end of shows. They were absolutely insane. And, you know, similarly to Dillinger's Skate Plan, they went out on top putting out easily their best album, but then they just kind of broke up and they were only around for about a decade. So it felt like you know, good in some ways because they're going out on top, but also bad because you didn't have it for quite long enough. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't really want to think about this, but thinking about the Slayer thing makes me think, okay, well, I guess the next round to go, I don't want to curse things, but I mean, Priest is probably getting close, you know, and then of course, I mean, Metallica, Anthrax, Megadeth, when, when are they, they going to wrap it up? I don't know. Don't want to think about it, but I guess we kind of have to. Ozzy Osbourne's gone next year. Be Ozzy Osbourne. Heard of him. <laughs> All right. Even though I'm a metal fan and I love my fucking doom and gloom and death and decay, we don't want to end on a negative note on Lockhorn's Redux. So let's uh, have some fun just to wrap this up. Our favorite single album of the decade. Think about it. Let's hear from what people have to say. Matthew Woodfin from Patreon says... Mastodon the Hunter, all right. Jamie Laszlo, Opeth's uh, Pale Communion. Mike S. Fisher, best album of the decade, Gojira's L'Enfant Sauvage. Uh, we've got Matthew Mach from Patreon, uh, Monolith of Inhumanity by Cattle Decapitation. Um, Mika Grossman, also from Patreon, uh, Elder's <coughs> Lore, it's a good album. Mike. Mark, pardon me, Deacon or Deacon from Patreon says Mariner by Cult of Luna and Julie Christmas, uh, Milos Kochi, Fallujah, Dreamless, ah, so many more. Who wants to go first? This is a tricky one. You guys ready? You got it? Do you have it? I narrowed it down. Yeah. I yeah. Brad, Brad, well, it's, it's, go. I was considering the secret Solvay Coagula, which is like black and hardcore converge. All we love, we leave behind. Big surprise. Brad picks a converge album. Right. Uh, but I think ultimately I, I settled on aborted and I was kind of between two of their albums, global flatline and the necrotic manifesto, but I'm going to go with global flatline, which is one of the hardest album titles of all time. I don't understand like these guys, like they blend like, you know, death metal and grindcore. It's like perfectly like insane Sven's vocals are awesome somehow he's managed to keep the sound of the band like consistent despite being the only you know consistent member and I, I think they're one of the best bands of the decade I think at the start of the, the decade they had, in 2010 they put out an EP after after their 2008 album Strike 9 which is like kind of their shakiest release and then 2010 they put out an EP and then everything they've done since then is basically being being gold um you know, I, 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 they're like, you know, death grind band, but yep. for some reason I don't understand, they don't get the, the praise that like some of the bigger bands do, do like, you know, maybe like a cattle decapitation or like right. they could tour with like a dying fetus and they've just kind of always been the underdog right. in that. And I just think they're phenomenal. They're just one of my favorite bands. Joe? Picking an album out of, you know, an entire block of 10 years is really tough, yep. but I would 
probably go with Between the Buried Me's Parallax 2. I'm going to lump in Parallax 1 along with that, even though it's an EP. Cheater. But uh, that yeah, album really too. captures me because it kind of has every single element of so many different mm -hmm. genres just mashed into one thing. The concept of the entire story is really interesting, uh, including so many different instruments. Like they basically had a full orchestra mm -hmm. put together along with their band. And then, you know, one, one of the big things that really stands out to me is uh, the song Extremophile Elite from Parallax 2 has this little tiny nod towards a song on the first EP. And it's the same rhythm, same structure, but played completely differently. And just all the little things that you can pick out with that album that you don't notice at first and notice later on, that's what made that album the best for me. I have so many. Do I have to pick one? You have to. Have to pick one. Can right, I mention you can all the, the runners up? up? You can, I mean, we, we both broke Rivers rules. Rivers of Nile, well. uh, Decapitated, which we may or may not want to talk about given what's happened but with that band. Which album? Anti-Cult. Okay. I think phenomenal uh, record. Um, at, at the Gates of War with Reality, phenomenal record. Uh, uh, so many. I think Emperor of Sand, Bat Mastodon's best album. <laughs> people after your review uh, yeah uh, you know it was a real grower for me and you know people don't really it's no longer cool to talk about lamb of god storm and drang was like by far their best album at least since sacrament or ashes of the wake it's it's a super super strong album it was it's actually when i look at the past decade in metal there's a lot of really impressive music that's been made but i think the one that that takes it uh by a nose at the at the line is uh gojira l'enfant sauvage uh i think gojira is quite possibly the most important metal band on the planet right now when it comes to their music their approach what they sing about the way they're able to bring so many different topics and emotions into their music i think is is hard to beat and i thought magma not quite as strong as l'enfant sauvage so that was i think that's my i think so at least today they're hella nice too good good dudes good people Respect. good french people yeah okay. okay thanks for joining us thanks for joining us thanks Brad, for having me joe pleasure thank thanks, you buddy uh thank you all for watching lockhorn's redux another good decade in metal Maybe we'll be here for the next one. I'm not sure. It doesn't matter. We'll see you next time on Lockhorns. Yeah.